All right, so first I'm gonna talk about um, what, is, uh, what is subcutaneous DARA, to DARA what's different? Um, does it work as well as IV DARA? Are the side effects the same? Um, what's the approval? And um, a big question is, is can I switch any, or can I start or switch any daratumab based regimen um, to subcutaneous dosing? Um, so, so what is subcutaneous daratumab? Daratumab typically is, as, as Dr. Richardson had already mentioned, is a, um, is a uh, monoclonal antibody against CD38. It, uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, historically have been given intravenously um, through the vein or through a port. Um, and uh, daratumab was developed with another drug called hyaluronidase. Hyaluronidase, in, when mixed with daratumab, is able to basically break down tissue in the skin and allow the antibody daratumab to be absorbed. And so that's, and so that's what's been developed. And now the, what, what, what's been developed is a, um, essentially a single syringe of, of the combination of daratumab with hyaluronidase. And it's in 15 milliliters, or 15 milliliters is a tablespoon. Um, and in 15 milliliters, it is injected over three to five minutes under the skin. And, and it's instead of a weight-based dose that we used with daratumumab, it's a fixed dose. So everybody gets the same dose of 1,800 milligrams under the skin, and the schedule is the same. The, the standard schedule for daratumumab is uh, once a week for two months, once every other week for four months, and then once a month. And with the subcutaneous version, it's the same exact schedule. Um, the... Um, so what's um, so? Let me just go through a little bit of the data here. Um, so there was a study that asked the question: um, Is essentially from a statistical standpoint, they the question was asked: Is under the skin or subcutaneous dera? Is it um, is it non inferior? And non inferior is a technical term. Um, but it's the type of term that it's a type of study that's done when comparing these two types of studies. And again, as everybody, as I mentioned before, the subcutaneous version of daratumab is given over three to five minutes. And as you see here, the first, the, the intravenous uh, daratumab at the first dose is on average it's seven hours. The second dose on average it's four and a half hours or 4.3 hours. And the third dose and beyond or on average is three and a half hours. Now, work done by my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Craig Hoffmeister at his prior institution demonstrated that daratumab could be safely given over 90 minutes. And, and, and in our practice, after that first dose, the patient then subsequently gets all, essentially all of their dose over 90 minutes, but it's still 90 minutes as opposed to three to five minutes. And so, as I mentioned before, the subcutaneous daratumab is a formulation of daratumab plus this hyaluronidase. And again, as I mentioned before, um, looking at a fixed dose for everybody. Um, and so they took, and so this study looked at patients, there was a total of 522 patients. Um, this was um, a, uh, relapsed refractory patient population, uh, as had mentioned by Dr. Richter before, the patient had had um, three prior lines of therapy, including a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID, and the patients had to be refractory. Or, or, um, they had to have three lines of therapy, or they had to be refractory to both a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID. Proteasome inhibitor like Velcade or Kyprolis, and an IMID like Revlimid or pomalidomide. Um, uh, because it's a fixed dose and not a weight-based dose, the, the study was very interested in the difference in outcome between different weights, less than 65 kilograms, um, um, between 66 and 85, and more than 85 kilograms, how many prior lines of therapy in the myeloma subtype. And again, half the patients got the subcutaneous daratumab, and half the patients got the IV. 
And the endpoints, the co what are called co-primary endpoints, and the questions were, what's the overall response rate? And this, and this is a technical term, the maximum seed trough, which is how much of the drug is in the body. And this is the responses between the two um, arms. In the standard IV arm, the overall response rate was 37%. Uh, a small uh, fraction of patients had a complete response. And then the subcutaneous version, um, the overall response rate was 41%. And again, a small fraction, about 2%, had a complete response. Similar number of patients had a very good partial response. And so again, the study asked the question, is the subcutaneous version non-inferior? And, and both from a statistical standpoint and from just a simple standpoint of looking at the numbers, the higher response rate is very unlikely to be inferior to the, uh, the higher response rate of the, of the subcutaneous version is very unlikely to be inferior to the lower response rate of the IV, IV version, hence it met the statistical endpoint of non-inferior. So the way, the simple way I look at this is that they're essentially equivalent from a response rate standpoint. Um, the subcutaneous works as well when used essentially by itself as, um, as the IV version. And then the question, the very important question comes up is what is the side effect profile? Now, um, when daratumumab was originally studied and for a lot of the original and for several of the original um, uh, publications, the a chance of getting an infusion-related reaction, fevers, chills, shortness of breath, cough, things like that, was about 50%. In this study, it was lower. It was about a third of patients got an infusion-related reaction versus what we'd expect to be about 50%. Why that happened? Maybe, maybe as, we're get, as we're using DARA more, we're getting better at preventing it. Um, um, but, it, uh, and so that would be my guess of why there was that difference. It could have been just, just a unique patient population. But as you see, the chance of getting an infusion related reaction was much lower with the under the skin, the subcutaneous daratumumab. Here it was about 13%. And so I would say that in the IV version, it's somewhere between about a third and a half. And you see in the subcutaneous version, it's somewhere between 10 and 20%. Either way, it's significantly lower. Now, um, the, the mo again, just like IV, the vast majority of the infusion reactions occurred with the first dose and uh, very rarely with subsequent doses. What we, um, the vast majority um, were uh, very mild in nature. When we uh, look at side effects, we use a system called grading. And, um, and, and the grading system we use is a one through five scale. And, the, and um, when, I, the, the, when I think about one through five uh, in terms of side effects, grade, it, it's um, mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening, or fatal. And so when we look at the side effects, most of them were um, uh, mild or moderate side effects. Um, there was a small percentage of patients who had what we'd call severe side effects. And that small percentage was lower in the subcutaneous version than in the IV version, one and a half percent versus five and a half percent. And nobody had, um, uh, in terms of infusion related reactions, um, life threatening or, and nobody had deadly side effects. And so that's good news uh, in that is that there's a lower overall side effect profile. There's a lower overall severe side effect profile. Now it's interesting that the difference is, and, and it's not surprising when we think about IV goes in very fast and the subcutaneous version has to get into the skin, then be absorbed, then get into the blood system that the onset, the average onset of um, developing an infusion reaction was one and a half hours for the IV version versus about three and a half hours for the subcutaneous version. And, um, they, and um, the vast, vast majority happened in that 
in, in that about four hour time frame of this entire study of the subcutaneous, the 260 patients, there was um, one or two patients who had a, a side effect when they weren't being observed in that six hour period of being observed. And it happened in the next one to two days. And, and in those very small percentage of patients, it was mild in nature. Um, and so as I and so as I said, so it was two happened in the IV and one happened in the subcutaneous. Um, the other question that always comes up with the subcutaneous version is what about skin side effects? And um, there was about in the, the study showed 6.9%. So the way I think about it is about five to ten percent. That's about one in ten to one in twenty patients will develop some sort of skin side effect at the site. And all of those were grade one or two, or as you or or as we say, mild or moderate. And none of these side effects, whether the infusion-related reactions or the under this or the or the skin side effect, led to discontinuation of the medication. Um, and so let me just make sure that I've covered all the things that I said I was going to cover. And there's two final things that I'll go over. So we already talked about what is subcutaneous darajumab, what's different about it. Does it work as well? And the answer is yes. Are the side effects the same? The, all the, uh, so all the other side effects associated with DARA, whatever they are, risk of infection or feeling fatigue or affecting um, the ability to do a, a type and screen, all the other side effects are exactly the same because they're not related to the delivery method. They're related to the drug itself and the drug itself that is active against myeloma and that has side effects because of the immune system are exactly the same. It is FDA approved. And, um, and, and then the question, the very practical question, if you're already on an IV, can I switch any daratumab based regimen to subcutaneous? And there, the FDA approval is somewhat limited. It didn't say you can uh, treat anybody, but the NCCN guidelines, these are guidelines um, that are essentially followed by all insurance companies and they're followed by all physicians and they're created by, um, phys by physicians who treat myeloma. And what, th what this says is that um, for all regimens containing daratumumab, this includes both daratumumab for intravenous infusion um, as well as a subcutaneous injection. And so while every regimen might not have FDA approval, this, this your, the, every regimen um, according to the NCCN is recommended either IV or subcutaneous. And um, so I will just tell you that at our practice, um, we have moved essentially all, when, if they're on daratumumab, we have essentially moved all of our patients um, to subcutaneous. It took us a couple of months to get all of our, in, all of our orders and all of our training done. Um, but but once, uh, once that was all done, all of our patients are moving from the IV to the subcutaneous. And for patients who are starting anew, they're all starting new on the subcutaneous. And I would imagine sometime in the next six months to a year, in a very similar way to what happened to um, to with 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 Velcade is that is that we're going to forget about what it was like to give intravenous daratumumab. Um, the, um, the, um, the other question that I think came up is um, if there was one patient who asked the question, they were on dexamethasone with daratumumab and then were able to come off of dexamethasone. That's never been really studied in a rigorous way, but we have patients who just can't tolerate any steroids at all. And after about a month of daratumumab can start tapering the steroids to off. And I think it's reasonable to do, again, never, never studied in a rigorous way, but I think reasonable to do if a patient doesn't have any infusion related reactions with the subcutaneous version also. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, appreciate everybody's attention. And I look forward to our roundtable of discussion.